Bé, bon dia a tothom. Benvinguts i benvingudes a aquest seminari web que organitzem des de l'Escola d'Administració Pública. Aquest seminari forma part d'un cicle de cinc conferències que hem organitzat a l'escola dintre del Pla de Desenvolupament de la Cultura de la Innovació a les Administracions Públiques. Per què aquest pla i aquest cicle de seminaris? Una mica la pretensió que tenim és que reflexionem en el context en què ens trobem, en la complexitat que en vam parlar en la darrera a la darrera conferència del Julius, en com podem, a través de la innovació, afrontar els nous reptes que se'ns van presentant i des de diferents perspectives amb els experts que formen part d'aquest cicle de seminaris. El cicle de seminaris l'ha organitzat i l'ha coordinat l'Albert Canyigaral, que ens acompanya avui, que moderarà la sessió d'avui i ella ens presentarà a la ponent. Us recomano també que entreu a la pàgina web de l'escola, a dintre de l'apartat d'innovació, que també hi trobareu tot de recursos i eines per desenvolupar les competències d'innovació que vam definir en la nostra publicació del perfil competencial de les persones innovadores a l'administració pública. A més a més, us engasquem, tindreu també accés en un enllaç en el cicle de seminari que us apunteu a les a les properes sessions, perquè realment ens estan aportant això que us deia, aquesta oportunitat de pensar i reflexionar en aquest àmbit. Albert, sense més, et dono la paraula perquè ens presentis a la Pia Andrius, que és la ponent d'avui, i una mica de què parlarem. Després també us explico que teniu per fer preguntes al final de la sessió a través del Question and Answer, sisplau, i sabeu que teniu la traducció simultània de la conferència, que és en anglès, en un canal de Zoom. Moltes gràcies i endavant, Albert. Moltíssimes gràcies. Un plaer, com sempre, poder estar aquí. Com s'ha comentat, sóc una mica el curador i facilitador d'aquesta sèrie de seminaris web. I com que ja s'ha introduït una mica tot el cicle, anar directament a que, si recordeu, vau poder estar en el primer seminari del passat 22 de febrer, Just a l'última diapositiva, el Julio Quajoto ens va presentar una cita on deia hem dissenyat les institucions que tenim avui, podem tornar-ho a fer. I el nom que acompanyava aquesta cita era Pia Andrius. Doncs aquesta és la millor manera de poder donar benvinguda a la nostra convidada d'avui, la Pia Andrius, que a més es connecta des de molt lluny, des d'Austràlia. Let me switch to English now to introduce Pia. Pia will talk uh, to us about the topic of adopting adaptive policy management, policy agility in a volatile world with a number of very innovative ideas and for thought. So I would suggest that you actually uh, get ready to take a lot of notes and prepare questions for that we will have some Q&A &A, uh, time after the presentation. Pia Andrews, uh, she's an expert in uh, open government, digital transformation and data. Pia works to transform the public services, policy and culture through greater transparency, democratic commitment, design focus on citizenship, open data and emerging technologies. All of it with a strong focus on real and pragmatic innovation in the public sector. She has been an advisor to the Canadian and Australian administrations, among many others. Um, abans de començar, recordar-vos, com ja s'ha comentat, que podeu seleccionar un canal d'àudio amb interpretació simultània en català. Si teniu qualsevol uh, dubte tècnic o voleu deixar algun comentari uh, o alguna observació o compartir algun recurs, teniu el, el canal de xat. I el que sí que us demanem és que les preguntes les poseu a l'apartat de Q&A, a l'apartat de preguntes i respostes, ja que al finalitzar la ponència deixarem alguns minuts per tal que la Pia pugui respondre les vostres preguntes. Les podeu fer en català, les podeu fer en anglès, jo faré la traducció i la facilitació d'aquest espai. And without further ado, and uh, thanking you for, the, for accepting the invitation, dear Pia, uh, the floor is all yours for the presentation. Thank you. Well, firstly, thank you so much for having me and bon dia to you all. Um, I, uh, my apologies for having to present in English. Uh, my second language is uh, Chinese Mandarin, and I do not think that would be particularly useful to you. But um, so uh, my, my apologies for having to present in English. But uh, I am hopeful that some of the work and lessons uh, from the last uh, 20 years in trying to innovate in government might be helpful. Um, I'm going to have some slides I will put up. I make these slides 
so that you have a um, a material uh, to take away with you. So um, my hope is that uh, it can be translated uh, at a later date, but uh, I will go through quite a lot of material, um, but I will be stopping in order to have a good and robust conversation um, uh, for at least half of the time. So, uh, so please, as you go along and identify what is of interest or what seems weird or confusing or or compelling, uh, please um, take notes so that we can uh, have a good conversation uh, after I get through some of this presentation. So you will also have to forgive me because I uh, am having to present from my phone because it turns out that my workplace, uh, which is a government department in Australia, will not allow access to Zoom. So I will uh, be uh, presenting from my phone and it is lucky for you that I have figured out how to do this uh, on Zoom now. So my hope today is to talk to you about ooh, about my lessons learned in adopting adaptive policy management. This is about all forms of policy. This is not just about advice. Uh, I'll leave my video on too. This is not just about uh, advice to government. This is about um, all forms of policy, including um, uh, legislation, regulation, um, uh, advice to government, um, operational policies, all different forms of policy uh, this is applicable to. So let's jump in. The first thing I would like you all to consider as part of this conversation is that we invented all of this. I think sometimes it is easy for public servants to forget that the systems and processes and structures and ways of working uh, that we are dealing with, uh, sometimes whether they're good or bad, were all invented by people, people just like you and I, which means they can be reinvented. We don't have to constrain ourselves to uh, what has been done in the past, especially given that the future is changing so much every day. It is incumbent on us uh, to reinvent where we need to so that we can uh, not just stay up to date with change and with um, new challenges and new opportunities, but so that we can um, uh, keep in time with the challenges and opportunities facing the communities that we serve. Uh, it's also worth remembering that how the public sector behaves is a huge lever. It is um, probably our biggest lever in driving change because when the public sector is innovative, that drives innovation throughout the entire sector and society and economy. When the public sector leans in on new technologies like AI, uh, it makes everyone feel more confident and comfortable if the public service does a good job. When the public sector actively and measurably shows benefit to the public that it serves, that creates um, uh, uh, confidence and comfort in others trying to do so as well. So there is also the context that we are all faced with about exponentialism. So the problem spaces we are dealing with are growing much faster than the ways that we currently work can keep up. The blue line here is a very rough <laughs> um, demonstration of the increasing pace of change, of complexity, and the yellow line is our ability to respond while ever we don't change. The simple truth is that the gap between what is happening around us and our ability to respond is now an exponentially growing needs gap. So the simple lesson here is that linear solutions cannot solve for exponential problems or exponential need. So we need to start thinking in exponential terms. How can we dramatically, dramatically and exponentially improve the impact of our public institutions um, so that we can respond to the um, to the exponential challenges around us. Um, and there is also an increasing risk in inaction. Uh, so I hope these slides are working okay, but um, the public sector is a bit like a boat. Um, when we put down, when we, when we you know, um, uh, take our ship in close to the shore in high tide, we have, uh, and then we put our anchor down, it feels very safe and stable for some time, but unfortunately, eventually the tide goes out. And if our anchor is still grounded in the reef, then as the tide goes out, we will find ourselves um, uh, completely ineffective. <laughs> it is very important to realize that the risk of inaction is sometimes much greater than the risk of taking any action. So we need to be able to be responsive to change 
and to do something. Uh, quite often something something quite new. There is also a gap that has emerged between policy design and delivery, and the, it is an artificial gap. It's a problematic gap, and it's a gap that has created um, substantial challenges for um, for adaptiveness in public institutions. How can you deliver a policy outcome in an effective way uh, when your policy design team have moved on to the next policy area and has thrown it over the fence to the delivery team who then have no ability to iterate or improve that policy in the first place. What we have is um, what I like to call the, uh, hold on, actually I'll skip past this slide. Oh, you may have seen this before. I don't know if you've all seen this picture, this video, but it's a good example of the problem that emerges when you split policy design and delivery. You have a person at this end who is sort of drawing a picture. The next person is interpreting what they think they mean. The next person is interpreting what they think they mean. There is a a series of subsequent interpretations, and these series of subsequent interpretations means what you end up with at the end of the process, as you can see, is quite different <laughs> from what the process started. This is no different to policy making, as it is for service delivery, as it is for regulatory design. You end up, oh, you can't see the video. Oh, well, you oh. end up with. Oh, okay, that's okay. I'll move to the next slide. This is a similar version, anyway. Can you see this? Yes, yes. Yeah, the slides, the slides are good. I'll, I'll get the okay. URL of the video and share it on the chat. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Uh, so policy, the current policy journey, certainly in Australia, and I would love to hear if this is also the case for you, is a series of black holes. You have the policy team saying, um, you know, well done on developing or delivering this new policy. Now we can move on to the next one. Uh, and they're always thinking in the back of their mind, I wish I knew how this went. I wish I could see it through. Uh, I wish I knew if this was going to be successful, but they're already moved on. So the policy instructions go into a bit of a black hole. Uh, from that black hole comes the instructions that the policy implementation people need to interpret best they can. They don't have access to the policy team sometimes. They have to figure it out for themselves and make the best interpretation they can, whether it's a service delivery team within a department or a uh, regulated entity in the uh, private sector. Anyone who has to interpret our policies and implement them, there's a bit of a, a gap between the intention and the implementation. And then, of course, even good policies can be can have unintended consequences when they're implemented, when they hit reality, when they start to conflict or contradict with other parts of the legislative or regulatory environment. And so there is a black hole of impact because even when people are monitoring for policy intent or policy effectiveness, which is not always the case, it's very hard sometimes to understand the unintended impacts, the unknown unknowns, and be able to mitigate for those. So we have this very broken system. Uh, the current policy cycle in Australia is very linear and very fragmented and different teams do different parts of this. And the challenge here, of course, is that even if you get better design of your policies at the beginning of the process on the right or better evaluation at the end of the process, you end up with this situation a bit like a waterfall where you're looking at the water right upstream and saying, let's let's design where the water could go or should go. And then the whole process until the water falls off the cliff and down into the waterfall, you're not seeing the impact until the end of the process. And that's where you kick in your evaluation. Everything in between is a little bit set and forget, a little bit uh, static, which means that as the water is coming downstream, you don't have a chance to redirect it, to dam it, to do something different with your water. Uh, so what we're trying to do is starting to iterate and change how we do policy, looking at the full policy life cycle, the realisation that everyone in that life cycle should be responsible for the outcome, realising if we, we need multidisciplinary teams to design, deliver and continuously iterate, continuously improve and optimise for the policy outcomes. So... What we want to do is to move from the current situation where we have narrowly informed, static, reactive, very assumptions-driven policy development where people say, well, this is what we did last time, so let's do this again, which of course is a scary thing to do. It, it reminds you of the, the anchor in the reef as the water is going out in the tide. Um, 
We have a very culturally exclusive design of policy where culture is either explicitly not involved in the process or it's a homogenous cultural, uh, cultural context. We have split policy infrastructure, so everyone is um, building their own interpretation of the policy and using a different interpretation in modelling or design than is used for service delivery. And I can tell you now, I have seen many examples around the world where the software system used for the uh, public service, the, the public facing uh, service, is actually different to what the legislation says and different to what the policy modelling said. Uh, leading to some major inconsistencies and certainly a lack of um, effectiveness in driving the policy outcome. Policy realisation is slow, of course, because the time it takes to design, develop, um, hand it over from team to team to team before you even know whether it's working or not. And then even if you find it's not working, you have no mechanism to go back and iterate the policy. Realisation is slow even when everything works well. Uh, and of course, at best, you have community engagement. But what we'd like to be able to move to is more multidisciplinary, dynamic, a responsive approach to policy reform rather than reactive, being able to see the change or the unintended impacts as they are emerging, being able to see that one policy intervention is less effective or more effective as it's happening so that you can scale one up and scale one down. More test-driven than assumptions-driven, being able to say, well, here's what happened in the past but let's test, let's try, let's see what works, and then let's choose to invest in what works. More culturally inclusive, shared infrastructure, and only through all of these things can we speed up the end-to-end -end policy realisation process and start to actually empower the community rather than just engage with the community. In Australia, we have a major um, reform agenda. Uh, so there's some good quotes here from some of our current ministers, our prime minister, saying if we don't shape the future, the future will shape us. Many of us have been saying this for a long time, so it's nice to see it's uh, made its way through into politics. Um, and our minister for the public sector had this fabulous saying about, at its heart, the APS is the Australian Public Service. This APS reform is about restoring the, tr the public's trust and faith in government and its institutions. We have a major once-in-a-generation reform agenda at the moment, which is why this uh, work to look at um, policy reform and, and how we manage and deliver policy is so timely. Uh, the reform agenda, um, without going into details, is, um, is systemic, is broad, and is actually trying to reinstitute the capability and purpose of public sector to be effective. So what does an adaptive policy management model require? So here's a couple of uh, insights, um, and I'll just run through this fairly quickly, um, but um, hopefully this will be useful to you. So the first three things that are needed, end-to-end -end policy management, so not just everyone breaking up the journey and just doing their part and then passing it on, but managing a policy from the from ideation phase right through to continuous improvement and delivery as one process. Uh, we need adaptive and agile multidisciplinary teams. Uh, so we can't just, again, hand things across between different functions. We need to have teams that are multidisciplinary and that can uh, work in an agile way. And we need an adaptive policy cycle. So the current policy journey is very slow, a lot of handover. Uh, we want to streamline the process end to end and actually get faster realization of intent. Uh, we also want to shift to an end to end adaptive um, um, policy management process where all of the people involved, um, including the public, including policy delivery, et cetera, actually co-design the policy intent, co-design the policy instruction, success criteria, and engage in some pre-testing of potential interventions to get to a point of having authority. So, you, so it's a policy uh, intent and authority process, getting your purpose right. And then the second phase, rather than eight phases that are disconnected, these are just two. The second phase is policy design and delivery where you are continuously monitoring, proactively managing, and uh, continuously working from the same infrastructure, the same instructions, and being able to continuously optimise uh, the systems, the services, the policy interventions, the legislation, the regulation, the rules, to ensure you're getting the outcome you expect and identifying and mitigating unintended impacts as they emerge. This means getting to a different type of policy cycle. Uh, so this is a 
draft process. This is not adopted in Australia yet, but we are in early phases of trialing and testing this approach where policy design and delivery is um, um, run through a, a more uh, test-driven and agile approach, as you can see here. So I, I do commend this to you and would love to get your feedback and thoughts on this uh, from um, as well. The next thing that you need for adaptive policy management is a scalable and digital approach. We can't just repeat the same old ways of working with new shiny toys, because then we will just get the same old outcome. Maybe it's faster, but what's the point on, on more speedily running off a cliff? We need to make sure that our processes, that our functions, that our programs are fit for purpose so that when we do speed them up, so when we do scale them up, uh, that they actually run in the correct direction. So we can start to do this by looking at things like deshrouding markets. So rather than perpetually um, investigating less and less of the regulated entities that we need to um, monitor uh, to the point where we're only looking at one or two or three percent, we can start to say, well, how might we regulate everyone? Um, maybe all those self-assessments that we ask regulated entities to undertake, we could publish publicly because then it's not just us looking at them. It's their competitors, their staff, even their customers will be very interested in making sure that a regulated entity is doing the right thing. So rather than government starting from a deficit model and saying, well, what's how much can we achieve with the small amount of resources that we have? We could start to look at surplus models where we take advantage of the natural motivations in the broader society and economy and start to draw them into a part of our program planning. Rules as Code provides a lot of opportunities for policy when we make our legislation and regulation available as a technical reference implementation, as an API, not only can all of the regulated entities, but also the legislated entities, so our own service delivery departments, can start to reuse that shared interpretation, that common interpretation of rules as code, legislation and regulation as code, uh, uh, so that we have a consistency in how legislation and regulation is modelled, how policy is reformed, how policy is monitored, and to make sure that we have a check and balance on the outputs and decision making of our people and our systems, including AI, of course. Um, effective regulatory inventions, uh, interventions need rules as code and need to be able to be tested against rules as code, as do legislation. I won't stop. I won't talk too much about rules as code now because I think we're very rapidly running out of time. So I'll just get through the last couple of points, which is adaptive policy management also requires to optimize outcomes over time. You can't set and forget. You can't say, oh, we designed the perfect policy and now it's implemented and look, it's working perfectly and then leave it for five years because the amount of change in the environment and complexity that is introduced every day means that we need to monitor outcomes and then be able to optimize and respond to change or to unintended introduced impacts as they emerge. This requires not just measuring and monitoring for our intent, but measuring and monitoring for the public impact, for the people impact. If we measure and monitor for policy intent and for quality of life, indicators for quality of life measures, then even if a policy is successful, if it's creating harm, we have a chance of knowing about that and being able to mitigate that. Conversely, we want to make sure that um, we're not just creating public benefit, but that our policy interventions are also successful. Uh, so there's also an opportunity, of course, to use um, AI, uh, to use machine learning to look for these patterns. So we're looking at things like when a policy change is introduced, why wouldn't we look at all the administrative data and say for that population affected by this policy, let's monitor for any unexpected patterns. If, uh, if our new policy creates unintentionally homelessness, we either need to stop the policy or we need to uh, mitigate the uh, the impact. So being able to use AI to monitor for impact, but we can also use rules uh, to check the, the moves. So for any of you that are chess players, hopefully you've noticed that the black rook has made a very strange um, move here. This is because it's a chat GPT versus traditional rules chess engine. And of course, generative AI doesn't understand rules, doesn't comply to rules, doesn't um, consume rules. It just makes it up because that's what it is. It's a synthesis engine. But we could use chaining of AI systems to have machine learning to look for patterns of impact and bias in outputs. We can use rules as code to test 
the the moves or the actions or the outputs of a system before it uh, before it moves forward. Uh, and we can actually, of course, start to um, understand and uh, monitor for the uh, un um, unexpected um, complexities and conflicts between the rules as we create them and between new policies as we create them. And then finally, uh, before we jump into some um, hopefully very uh, useful conversation, shared policy infrastructure. Now, I know that the term policy infrastructure is not a known term. Um, to be honest with you, I did make it up. Um, but the reason I introduced this concept is because a lot of policy people don't think they use data or infrastructure. A lot of infrastructure people don't think about policy. But policy infrastructure, quite simply, is all of the data and tools and systems and modeling and um, even service delivery infrastructure that is involved in the end-to-end -end, uh, design, delivery, management, and ideally optimization of policy and policy interventions. So if we start to realize that everything we do in government is really part of policy infrastructure, then we have a chance of actually building the sort of infrastructure and architecture that can help us be more adaptive. So right now, every team runs their own uh, infrastructure, their own tools, their own software, their own data. Imagine if we actually had a shared approach to that infrastructure. So everyone was working from the same interpretation of policy. Everyone was monitoring and modeling and measuring for the same um, policy intent with a shared understanding of what the desired impact of, of a policy intervention should be and being able to, again, monitor for and escalate when things are going in the wrong direction or creating an unintended harm. Here is a concept model of policy infrastructure that we are working through and starting to implement in various places. And uh, this is not perfect by any stretch, but it is a starting point and it is already starting to get people realizing you can't just build data over here and modeling over here and service delivery over here. You actually need to start thinking about everything that's needed end to end for policy and, um, and starting to pull that together into a, a shared and common reference architecture. So I'll finish with just these last couple of thoughts. Here's a few um, ways that we are starting to do this work, uh, certainly in Australia, but I've done similar work in other jurisdictions too. Uh, the starting point here is that real change does need pressure. And I think we are all under that pressure now. We are under budgetary pressure. We are living in a time of continuous poly crisis, continuous crises, uh, financial, health, um, uh, environmental, of course, and, but real change does need pressure. So being able to embrace that pressure as an opportunity for change is good. And after all, you can't get a diamond without pressure. So this is a good opportunity for us to shift from being coal into diamonds. Some ways that we are trying to work include, um, but, you know, we already have a reasonable da data and AR maturity in several of the places that, um, including the place that I work. We are looking at how exponentialism is affecting our operating models. And that is actually driving structural reform and structural transformation. It's starting to force departments to say, how might we achieve our mission in today's context, rather than just using technology to keep doing more of the same? We are implementing policy efficacy as a service, policy analysis and monitoring and measurement as a service. We're building policy twins, so digital twins of policy as part of our policy infrastructure so we can start to have a shared reference implementation across the entire journey. We're building out portfolio and outcome analytics to help with strategic decision-making and senior executive groups so that they can see, rather than just how efficient something is, how effective it is. Starting to look at success as not just being about uh, financial or cost benefits realization, but about policy outcomes and public impact. And of course, starting to look at and have made some good progress with him. So I'll leave you with this last thought, which is not just that we invented it so we can reinvent it, but the realization that a lot of people are worried about how might I change the system? But the fact is there's really not such thing as a system. The system is people and those people are us. So when we change, then we do change the system. Uh, everything that has been created has been can be recreated. And if we don't do it, then who will? So I, I guess I invite you to, um, and I'm sure that you're already on your own journey of change and transformation. So I'm 
looking forward to hearing from and learning from your journey as well. But uh, hopefully this has been um, helpful for you and I do um, look forward to uh, joining hands with you so that we can continue, uh, so we can walk this journey together. So I'll finish there. Uh, so adoptive, adopting adaptive policy management is about effective and humane policy delivery that is responsive to change and continuously optimized over time. I'll stop sharing these uh, slides, hopefully, and um, I would welcome a conversation. Thank you, Pia. That's been a, a very impressive amount of ideas and, example, uh, and, and, and concepts. Uh, in a very short period of time, so we, as, as you were saying, we we are we are good on time to have this conversation. We are collecting some questions. I encourage people who are raising hands in the in the in the chat. You need to leave your Q and A in the Q and A section of the of the Zoom tool because we cannot uh, put you in the in the Zoom. It's a little bit complicated. So please leave leave the question there. While we are collecting some of these questions, let me uh maybe um ask a uh, first one on my side uh for uh people in the administration everything that you explained can also feel a little bit overwhelming i think no? all the amount of change so what are some of the let's say low-hanging fruits uh on all these processes ideas that uh, you would encourage to maybe test and experiment on from from all these different uh approaches that you mentioned what is something sure. that, uh, that can help um, unblocking? For sure. I like to choose a policy area and go and engage with the policy owners, engage with the people who are in the delivery of that policy area, pull them together and say, we all agree there's a problem. <laughs> so how might we do this differently? So in my current job, we have done exactly this. We've reached out to, we've been talking to people about the opportunities for adaptive policy and people have immediately recognized that uh, this could help them to deliver better public outcomes and better policy outcomes. So we've had a, a fabulous, um, by, by going out there and talking about what's possible, it has attracted people who are interested. So rather than having to knock on every door and beat down the door, and beg at the door, we can just get up on a mountain and shine and anyone that wants to come and play will come and play with us. So I think working in the openly, uh, in the open will attract um, uh, allies and people willing to, to experiment. I think having a, a, a compelling vision that acknowledges the challenges of the people that you're working with will again, uh, encourage people to try something. Um, but I think the key thing is this kind of innovation doesn't start with a big bang. It doesn't start by saying, let's go and find a billion dollars to try something new. It, it is always started by working within people's existing budgets. So being able to say, how about we just free up just a couple of people, just for a couple of months, let's try something. And what we found is, okay, let's try, you tell us what the success for your policy is and because I, because I'm a chief data officer, I can go and get the data to start monitoring for that. Okay, cool. I'm going to give you a dashboard that shows you how your policy outcome is tracking. Okay, now you can see that. Now let's add the next thing. So you just add little bit by little bit. You start by solving a problem, but you start solving a problem in the direction of the vision. While ever you have a very strong north star of what what you are collectively trying to achieve. You have an opportunity, even with baby steps, to walk in the right direction. But when there's no North Star, when there's no shared vision, even a baby step might be in the wrong direction, <laughs> and then you have to come back again. So I think the key thing is start from a, a shared understanding of what good looks like, because then whether it's through projects together or through subsequent investment or planning, everyone naturally starts to walk in the same direction uh, without coercion or coordination when you have a shared vision of good. So try to get that shared vision and then just take little bites towards that vision, identify where there are gaps and de and show and demonstrate what is possible. I think you can sometimes talk about a good idea until you're blue in the face and it won't um, shift a person's ex perspective. Mm -hmm. But if you can invite them to experience change, 
then they change forever. Excellent. Thank you for the additional hints. We have actually a good number of questions on the on on on, on the buff and the queue. Uh, I will go the I will try to go them um, sequentially. And the first one links very well with the end of your in, uh, initial answer because it's from Diego Saez from the Mataró uh, uh, municipality. Um, they said that you said that the risk of inaction is greater than taking any action. It was the image of the boat on the on the administration. What if any action, this this any action is in the wrong direction? No? You are, uh, what are the precaution or prevention principles? What about the, the, the precaution or prevention principles from, in the public administration? So there's always a how to strike a balance. Yes. Um, so there's kind of three directions, isn't there? There's the right direction, there's no direction, and there's the wrong direction. Hmm. I would argue that, um, first of all, no direction, you become that boat. Even the wrong direction gives you momentum that you can turn and come back in the right direction. Um, so even a direct, even a shift in the wrong direction can sometimes, I would suggest, always <laughs> be better than nothing. But it starts also from how you determine success. So for something critical to the public, like access to an emergency service, if the current process is too hard for anyone to access, then anything, even something slightly worse, will be possibly better. <laughs> um, if, um, but if you don't determine that success is more people getting access, then every direction will be wrong. The reason why I'm so passionate about this adaptive policy approach is the observation that I have made over many years where people say, let's spend three years figuring out the right thing to do before we start. But over those three years, the situation has got worse. And then when they have the perfect policy and start implementing it, it's out of date the very second they start implementing. So from my perspective, if you put in place measures, if you are measuring and monitoring for the intended impact, then there's no such thing as a wrong direction. Because if you go in the wrong direction, your measuring and monitoring will tell you you're going in the wrong direction, and then you can course correct. If you're not measuring and monitoring, then it doesn't matter what direction, you wouldn't know if you're going in the right direction. There's an old Alice in Wonderland quote. It's something like, um, um, oh, <laughs> it's something like, um, I, I don't know where I wanted to go, but, um, uh, well, then how do you know when you've got there? Oh, <laughs> so... I think it's, a, I totally got this quote wrong, but you understand the point, hopefully. So if you are monitoring for your intended impact, there's no wrong direction because even the wrong direction, you can identify and do something about it. Does I hope this answers the question. I, I, I think so. Uh, we actually have more questions piling up, so maybe we need to be a little bit brief on the answers. No, no, because I'm, I'm very interesting ones. Um, um, there is a, a question from Zhuan Chu asking, uh, how can you match this approach to a new way of managing public policies versus the traditional old-fashioned manners that appear uh, to be on everyday uh, regulation of the administration administration processes? So how, how probably is more the cultural change? Um, no? Sure. Um, yeah, on, on yeah. the front. Uh, I think there's two things here. So first of all, our existing processes have, at least in, in the countries I've worked, you can, you can use existing processes to do something different. So for instance, when you're drafting new regulation, rather than doing all the drafting and pushing it through the parliament and then people being left to interpret and figure it out, you could introduce into your existing processes drafting in human and machine language simultaneously. Um, there are lots of countries around the world that already draft simultaneously in multiple languages. I worked in Canada for a while. They're drafting in French and English simultaneously. They, mm -hmm. they come up with new regulation they want. They don't put it into English and then French. There would be a revolution. Um, they, they say, okay, here's the goal. Okay, let's draft it in French and in English at the same time. Um, and that way you're not getting a translation. So when we started talking about, so why not just add a third language, a machine language, when you're drafting in human and machine language at the same time, drafting in code forces you to try to test your assumptions. 
Okay. Um, in in our in our planning for this regulation, um, we said, for instance, for every working week, you must get paid X. So then the coder, the, the software developer says, well, what do you mean by working week? Mm-hmm. Well, what do you mean? What do I mean by working week? Well, do you mean uh, 40 hours, 37.5 hours? Do you mean five days times eight hours? What about someone that's working three jobs? What about someone who is working part-time? And that, that one little example um, demonstrated why some regulation in New Zealand failed because the human version, the only version of the regulation said for every working week. And of course, everyone interpreted that differently. So drafting in code, doing a test-driven approach where you get a technical reference implementation of your new regulation means that you can use the consulting process to test with people a the regulation and a reference implementation, which means that when the human version goes to the parliament, you can now publish an API as a reference implementation. So you can use your existing processes, but just faster and a bit innovative. And when it comes to the management of policy, in the first instance, you can't completely restructure your organizations. Of course, this is goal eventually, but that's not day one. What you can do is just reach across the aisle. Okay, if I'm building new policy, I'm going to invite some people who will have to consume this policy into the process. Okay. If I'm trying to implement policy, I'm going to invite some people who wrote the policy into the process. So in the first instance, you don't have to have a complete revolution. You can just invite people to be part of this together. And that actually starts to drive some fundamentally better ways of working, even within existing processes. I hope this makes sense. Mm-hmm. It does. Um, I'm jumping here one question because it links very well again with the, with the final of uh, with the ending of your current uh, answer um, from uh, Liliana Royo, who is asking uh, if you could further elaborate what a little bit on what you were saying now on this envision of the role of the citizens along the process of adaptive policy making, and especially any specific suggestion to advance in terms of meaningful participation because we know that inspiration they invite very often for this participation but sometimes it's hard to get the citizens uh, involved and to in a meaningful way so just one quick example because again we have to still have a ton of questions so i will send you a link to an article that goes into that into some depth um but i have to make two very quick points there are many ways that public servants can invite the public into the process in co-design, in governance, in um, testing, in many ways. The biggest problem that we face is that people do not have the time. So my suggestion is in the same way that for service design, we tend to, to create user research panels and pay people for their time. We say, can we interview with you for, as for user research to help inform a service? and we'll pay you for half an hour or an hour of your time, why wouldn't we do the same thing with policy? It's, it's, a, it's a form of user research. I think that we need to look at things like um, civic gap years, inviting members of the public to come and, like jury duty, to come and, and participate in policy. In um, New Zealand, they set up policy juries where they would invite members, a diverse range of members of the public to actively participate in shaping major and sensitive policy areas, things like stem cell research. They actually set up a policy jury where people were paid for their time for three months to represent public community sentiment in helping shape major policy areas. So you're not going to do something that big for all policy areas, of course, but being able to identify and remediate the fact that most citizens, including you and I, because public servants are citizens too, um, are too busy. They're busy at work, they're busy at home, they're desperately just trying to keep food on the table. So when we put out a paper and ask for comment, of course people don't have time to give feedback. So we need to figure out uh, equitable and um, funded mechanisms to get the public involved. Okay, that's I think a very specific and clear way. Also on, on this area of examples, there is a question from Anna Castelvi, if you can give uh, uh, as an example of policy twins uh, infrastructure, especially starting with the policy twins. Oh, sorry, you just uh, want me to expand? Yeah, yeah, just one example of uh, policy twins or policy infrastructure. Oh, that my, uh, my favorite example is from France. Uh, so the French government developed um, a piece of infrastructure called Open Fisca. Open Fisca is um, 
a legislation as code um, piece of software, uh, all social and taxation policy is encoded in Open Fisca, which means that every single, and this is fascinating, every single new policy proposal that has any impact on social or taxation um, has to propose their changes in the software and uh, the software has all of the population data uh, in it, which means that you have to show the actual impact on the actual people of France to get your policy through. And it also, because it's a public tool, anyone can play with those rules. So suddenly you can say, oh, the government is, um, or the opposition is proposing this change. Okay, I'm going to put that change into the code and I'll see, oh gosh, that that's very bad for me. That's very bad for my community. So no, I don't want that change. So I think in the first instance, um, policy twins provide an opportunity for departments with better modeling, better monitoring, better policy delivery. But the longer term opportunity, uh, which not everyone will agree, <laughs> um, but I'm quite excited about, is creating public uh, visibility, um, access and, um, and participatory mechanism for people to test and explore what policy changes might help their communities. I think that will yeah. uh, maybe later of the um, you can send some links on on some of the mm. examples and we'll include them in the in the blog post that we do after the after the sure. session. So maybe mixing also two questions more on um, on the organizational side of of, of that from Sara Echevarria and Lola Valles. Um, so saying that the, the vision is a, is a is a huge step uh, forward on the way of of thinking. Uh, and the question is, who is leading the project? Uh, it's a multidisciplinary sector team. I know a little bit, how are you moving from highly hierarchical organization to a more horizontal organization? Well, no, a little bit, uh, how is your team working and how did you oh. manage to have leverage on the, on, on the, on the administration? So um, because I am not familiar with your context, um, I won't make any assumptions. So I'll I'll tell you, I guess, a bit of the story I have experienced. A lot of the time we have the enabling functions in a department. So your CIO, your CDO, these things um, sitting over here. And then you have the policy areas sitting over here. This is the same where I've worked over the years. Um, right now I'm a chief data officer um, and I do not sit under the CIO, I sit uh, in an executive function. Um, so I, I do have amazing data and AI technical people and, and analysts and economists and all these things, but I genuinely don't think, like there's no one actually in charge of reforming policy in government, no one. There's a lot of people in charge of our policy team but actually trying to drive reform of policy as a whole is um, is not always um, very clear. So because I've come into, in every government I've worked in, I tend to reach out and, and engage with people around what is possible, how might we? So with establishing the policy infrastructure, because I'm the chief data officer, I can just do it within my remit. I can say, well, policy a policy twin is just policy as data. So I'm going to build a policy twin as part of my data infrastructure. And, um, and that will help you then monitor, which, of course, as a data person, I can help you monitor your policy impact, your policy outcomes. The chief economist is in my function. So if you want economic analysis of your policy, we can provide that too. So we sort of have this unusually helpful combination of functions but you don't need to have that. You can just say, here's an opportunity, who else wants to play? And what I have found over the years is when you say a bit like a, you know how the difference between a cat and a dog, right? Mm -hmm. When you go to a dog, they're very enthusiastic, too enthusiastic. So you kind of take them for granted a little. But when you go to a cat, they sort of say, oh, maybe, maybe I'll talk to you. And that makes you want to pat them. So you have to be like the cat. You have to say, we have this amazing opportunity. Would you like to play? If not, that's okay. We can go play with somebody else. And people say, oh, well, I want to play with you then. Oh, okay, if you'd like to. Um, I feel like transformation is best done when lots of people feel an internal motivation, which means you can't push or pull them. You need to engage and then create that shared energy, that shared goal. 
Does this make sense? I hope this is helpful. Yeah. I think so, and, and thank you yeah, for not uh, making any assumptions on, 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 on the local context. A little bit, I'm jumping also here. There are some additional questions from people who, who had before, so I'm jumping to a new uh, from, from and, and linking also with your last answer um, from Sarah, Sandra Hernandez. Um, she was asking, how do you measure policy impact on public that you already answered uh, a little bit? Uh, and how can how can we know that the trust in public sector is actually restored? You were saying no, there was yeah. a, a decrease. So uh, how, yeah. do you, how, how can you measure the, the impact on the on the public and also especially the trust on the public sector? So in Australia, we do have a very good survey that I do recommend to you. It's called the Trust in the Australian Public Service. And what they've identified, what they do is every month they do proper polling of the public on trust. And it's not, and what they found was very interesting. Um, for a long time, unfortunately, it has been assumed if you provide good quality of services, then people will trust you. But the simple fact is that the test for trust in the public sector is entirely different than the test for trust in the private sector. And this is because we have um, a monopoly of power, as you all very well understand. Um, because of this special superpowers um, that the public sector has, the, 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 the test for trust has to be higher, must be higher, should be higher. So the shift that is starting to happen, and I am a very passionate advocate for this, is rather than saying, how can we get people to trust us? We need to start acting more trustworthy. We need to start asking people, what would it take you to trust me? And, and for an example, I, I was involved in a cross-government um, uh, discussion about data a few years ago. And we went around the, the table and everyone talked about their lovely programs. Um, but then I asked them, you know what? I want to ask you a a personal question. What would it take you to trust me with your data? Forget my role, forget your role, forget that we work in government. I'm saying me, Pia Andrews, what would it take you to trust me with your data, your kids' data, your, your partner's data, your mother's data, your child's data? What would it take you to trust me? And they all wrote down all these things. I'd need to know that it, it wasn't being used against me. I'd need to know it was protected. I'd need to know it wasn't being sold to somebody. They went all around the table. And then at the end of the process, we then said, okay, now tell us about your data programs. And by happy coincidence, not a single thing that they were doing in their data programs addressed any of the things that they, they said that they would need as individuals to see, to trust me to have their data. And when I pointed this out, they realized that uh, they'd been so focused on good technical outcomes that they had lost that human bit. What does it take a human to trust another human is, is a profound question. And it's only when you engage in that conversation that there is a chance that you might be able to earn their trust. Thank you. Lauren. The examples are always very illustrative. So thank you for that. I think that will be the, the end question. I'm sorry for the people that will not be able to have their questions answered. I can try to maybe pass some of them or a summary of them to, to Pierre later on for, for some of these references. Uh, and just to go in a slightly different direction, uh, Maria Garcia Brugada, she's asking, how are you working in Australia on this perspective? Because you you, you said that the future is changing very much and almost every day. So what are, what is the perspective work? Uh, what are the tools that you are using to have these 10 or 15 years uh, analysis of what's coming on and, and the impact of policies in this potential future? So you have any department or tools that you can point to? That's a much bigger question than, than I can do in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> I look like a lot of the traditional tools uh, for modeling and predicting. Um, you know, we use a lot of artificial intelligence, a lot of modeling tools, um, a lot of data analysis, et cetera, and projections. But again, you can't, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So using data to model what will probably happen with your policy will never be a replacement for the thing that is actually missing right now, which is once the policy is in place, are you monitoring for that expectation? Because it is inevitable, it is inevitable that there will be some other policy out there that will contradict your policy and that will actually um, uh, limit it from meeting its full potential. And you won't know unless you're monitoring as you implement. 
So this is the big shift. It's not just about analysis. It's about introducing the the benefits of um, CICD, continuous improvement and continuous delivery, into the policy life cycle so that you are monitoring, measuring, and responding to the reality of what's happening, not just to your prediction of what might happen before, uh, if this makes sense. So, um, so yeah, we have big data infrastructure, we have um, dashboards, we have uh, elevation tools. There's many, many things, um, but, um, but I do encourage you to have a look at the slides that I sent, uh, have a look at the policy infrastructure reference implementation. And if you'd like to know which actual tools we're using in each of those boxes, I would be more than willing to... more than willing to do so. Thank you. We have more comments and questions coming up, but uh, I think we, we've, we've uh, covered our, our time. We'll try to digest some of the comments and questions and maybe get an offline answer that we can uh, also add into the into the blog post and all these technical references and examples that you mentioned. Just uh, thank you very much. I think the, the, the level of engagement shows the, uh, that everybody was really uh, happy and people are raising hands and clapping so uh, and sending a lot of love here in, <laughs> in, uh, in, mm -hmm. in the Zoom. So thank you very much again for accepting the, the invitation. Thank you for all the information and examples that you share with us. And we have a lot of food for thought for the next days or weeks or months. So and we'll keep in touch. I just want to quickly say thank you so much for the warm invitation and for uh, the very compelling questions. I genuinely hope that was helpful and interesting to you. And uh, I look forward to learning uh, more about, uh, about you all and about the work you do and finding opportunities to collaborate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pia, from the school. Uh, it's really delightful to hear you. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you to the translator. I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. very <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.